many of us suspect, maybe even you, suspect that big food manufacturers have other goals besides the good health of the citizens who spend their hard-earned money on their products. And I've got a special guest today who had an inside peek at how big food manufacturers think and even big pharma manufacturers. And so if you, if you know someone who thinks that Coca-Cola and McDonald's and Kraft Heinz and Mondelez has your best interest at heart, I would highly encourage you to share this video with them. You can share it and send a link in a, in a direct message, an email, a text message. They need to watch this video because what Callie Means is about to tell you is a bit disturbing. It may be upsetting, and, and that's good. I want you to be upset by this because I think for long enough, the people with billions of dollars have made decisions in my interest and in your interest when they should not have been doing that. So I'm going to bring up my guest. This is Callie Means. Welcome, Callie. So glad to have you. Okay, okay great to be here and talk about this topic. This is a, this is a very important topic, and it's a – it's kind of a difficult topic to talk about. And I think for many people listening, it's difficult to wrap your head around the things that you have to say about how big food thinks about the average consumer. Yeah. Can, can I've been on a journey because as you said, early in my career, I was working for these companies, saw inside the room. Um, and, you know, in, in the recent years, you know, reading books by you, reading books by Dr. Mark Hyman, Rob Lustig, you know, these books really calling out the system. My sister, Dr. Casey Means, who's been outspoken on this, the co-founder of Levels. I, I, I've been on this transition to really understanding this is the most important issue in the world. And, and I got to say, um, you know, in, in the previous years, I was despondent. I was very upset. Um, and I think you set it up really well. What I hope folks can take from this conversation is actually empowerment. I, I do think that the first step to taking control of our health and really, I think, fixing the biggest issue in the country, which is that we're all becoming metabolically dysfunctional, especially our kids, which is, you know, it's literally cellular dysregulation, which I, I couldn't think of a more important issue. It's happening systematically. Um, the first step is actually just acknowledging what's going on, um, because I think patients have been gaslighted over the past couple of decades to not ask questions yeah. in the face of violence happening to ourselves. So, yeah, I'm really excited to dive into this. Yeah, I think patients and customers have have both been gaslit because if you start to if you start to pontificate about, well, I wonder what Coca-Cola, I wonder if, if, you know, I wonder what their strategy is. I wonder how they why are they spending all this money on lobbying? you're quickly labeled as a conspiracy theorist. Oh, absolutely. Quickly, quickly, and then you're canceled, and then you're ignored. But I think it's maybe time for even people who consider themselves part of the intellectual crowd to start going, you know, over the last three or four years, a lot of the conspiracy theories have turned out to be true. And maybe, just maybe, we should start to listen to people like Callie Means and, and, and think about this and then decide what are, what are we going to do about it as individuals, but also as small groups and hopefully as larger groups, what are we going to do to change our system? Because I, for one, am sick and tired of it. Tell us, yeah. Callie, tell us your, exper your experience. How, how long were you a consultant? Right. Uh, we, if you don't mind saying what companies were you consulting with, if you're allowed to say that. No, I, I'm laying it all on the table because I think I, this is my life's calling the most important uh, issue in the country. And I, I think, yeah, let, let me go through my background because I think these issues are so large. And I think what's hopefully been resonating is just really breaking it down to specific companies and specific issues can at least get a little bit more, hopefully arm viewers with a little bit more of just an understanding of how systems work. Because I think these stories are transferable to almost everything. But I grew up in Washington, DC, and my dream was to, you know, if impact public policy in the United States. And, you know, I was at more on the conservative end. I interned at the Heritage Foundation. I went to Stanford, studied public policy, worked on a couple campaigns. And what I learned after those campaigns were over is that almost everyone in politics on the left and the right uh, see themselves uh, across the table consulting for uh, special interests. But the big behemoth, um, and I think a lot of us know this, but, but it's very clear, uh, the big behemoth is healthcare interests. Pharma specifically spends five times more on lobbying than the oil industry. It spends three times more than any other industry in the country. You know, when you when you add up all the healthcare interests, interests at the American Medical Association, hospitals, 
pharma, they add up to about 35% of all lobbying spending in the country. And the second biggest spender, the, big, the other big behemoth in Washington is big food. Um, so I'll start with Coke. Uh, the specific story, the specific issue I worked on with Coke in 2011, 2012, and just to be specific, as you, as you talked about, the, the umbrella groups, the American Beverage Association. So all these groups kind of hide behind umbrella groups. So it's Coke, Pepsi, other sugary drinks are funding this organization. Coke's obviously the big one. Uh, but they okay, wanted you guys watching yeah. this. We've already got 1300 watching this. We need way more than that. Callie Means is about to pull back the curtain and tell you guys how Coca Cola does what they do, how they use their money and influence to sway Congress, to sway the USDA, to sway the FDA. Please share this video right now on your social media. There are 10,000 people need to be watching this right now because this is important. Go ahead, Callie, spill the beans. Yeah. So, so the specific issue was that members of Congress were saying that Coke should not be an item on food stamps. Uh, food stamps is a very important government program. Uh, it's $115 billion. It's 15% of Americans uh, depend on this for nutrition. You know, whether you, you know, agree with it or not, this is a vital program that a lot of people. And I think you on. said it exactly right. They depend on it for nutrition. The, right. 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 Yeah. And, and, and just to back up, I'm, I'm a libertarian. I think a lot, a lot of drugs, you know, frankly, should be, be legal. I, I think we can all agree addictive drugs that have no nutritional value that cause a lot of harm, which sugar unquestionably is, um, should not be funded by government nutrition programs. This is this is a vital lifeline that the 15 uh, percent of Americans at the, at the lowest income level depend on um, and rely on. And Coke wanted to keep food stamp spending on soda. Now, believe it or not, uh, sugary drinks, soda specifically, is the number one item purchased back then and up until today. On so food you stamps. mean when, when somebody takes their their food stamps or their, their SNAP benefits to the yes, grocery store, out of all the things, all the meat, all the vegetables, all the canned goods, all the dry goods, soft drinks are the number one thing that food stamps are spent on. Sugary drinks are 10% of all food stamp spending. Yes, the number one item. This is a material percentage of Coke and Pepsi's revenue. Okay, these highly addictive, I call it diabetes water. This weaponized sugar that's hitting our bloodstreams is the number one item, okay? And when you back up, 70% of food stamp spending is processed crap. This is absolutely unprecedented compared to other developed countries. There is a mass bipartisan effort to figure out, you know, children's nutrition, lower income nutrition in almost every other developed country. You know, and you look at the BC rates, you can understand. But this is absolutely a rigged system, a huge part of Coke's revenue. And the mission was how do we keep it that way? And there was a couple elements to the playbook. And the playbook really revolves around rigging institutions of trust. Um, so, you know, something I've talked about a lot, but I think it's very instructive. You know, this is not complicated. And we see it today. If you call someone a racist or racialize the debate or, you know, make somebody feel like they're fat shaming or, or offending some a marginalized group, the debate really shuts down. And <laughs> this is well known. Um, so Absolutely. back then, one of my and I was pretty junior, but one of my first jobs was to put a list together of civil rights organizations, you know, African-American pastors, things like that. And we would reach out and we would, you know, and just to just to take you inside. Right. It's not an evil conspiring, but it's like, hey, you know, your communities really like these sodas. Uh, there people are trying to take away choice. You know, would you we'd love to make a donation. Would you be you know, w w could we create a strategy to keep choice? Of course, that's just a just a complete perversion of the dis discussion, because what's actually happening is it's keeping government money, tens of billions of dollars of government money going to this diabetes water, right? It's terrible public policy, but that's how these discussions happen. And as the New York Times reported at the time, uh, the NAACP and the Hispanic Federation, some of the most leading civil rights groups in the country went on a war path, uh, calling parents who were concerned about kids ingesting a hundred times more sugar than they did a hundred years ago. The fact that 25% of kids now have prediabetes, which is just unprecedented and just a, just a scandal, obviously. Um, calling them racist and and racializing the debate and saying we're taking away choice and that was all driven by public relations consultants for Coke, you know, unfortunately myself seeing this and being a part of it, um, driving that. 
So the civil rights, that's a, that's a big example, and it's continuing, obviously, today. And today it's really expanded into the body inclusivity movement. There originally came out that Nestle and other processed food makers have been funneling millions of dollars to body in, uh, positive TikTok influencers. And there's really been this systematic uh, debate to, to label doctors asking about weight or talking about food or talking about exercise as fat shaming. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, how do we weaponize these groups to make you know, basically anyone asking questions a little bit nervous. And now, you know, again, those tactics are being used today. But yeah, back to Coke, a couple other big things. And and, and one I really want to highlight, and, and I think we all know this, we all know that research can be rigged. But I just want to say one stat here that I saw firsthand, which is that Coke and processed food companies, according to Mark Hyman and his book, Food Fix, and, and some other sources, send 11 times more funding basic nutritional research than the NIH, okay? 11 times more. And I can tell you, you know, all these studies say that the funding came from Coke or the funding came from the American Beverage Association, but that didn't impact the research. Let me tell you, let's just use our common sense. Let's not be gaslighted here. If processed food companies are paying billions of dollars, which is what it is for nutrition research, they expect something in return and they are getting it. <clears throat> um, we still, to this day, have studies from leading research in institutions questioning whether sugar causes obesity. Today, still, the foundational research from the NIH and Tufts, this food compass, is, as you probably, I think, you, I think you've recently done a video on, on this, um, it says literally, I mean, it, it sounds ridiculous, but it's, it, it would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. This goes into childhood nutrition guidelines, but the lucky charms are healthier than beef. Um, yep. But back then, back then, right, it, it, it's a ton of studies just pounding down. It's, you know, it's very simple. You fund the studies. The studies question the efficacy of sugar, all the of sugar, all of these research, nutritional research that there's thousands, they're being used and weaponized to throw to lawmakers and regulators say, we can't villainize sugar. It's it, it's cheap calories. And that so it's pay for the study, take that study to regulators, to members of Congress, confuse the debate. So yep. I believe that research studies, seeing this and just literally having a list of professors, um, uh, you know, uh, from Harvard, from Tufts, from other top places. Um, and just just that money being directed. Now, I think a lot of these professors are good people, but they are absolutely pawns in a scheme to, to confuse the debate. We didn't even care what these studies said. We just wanted studies that said different things, that questioned a lot of different things and getting yeah. away from the core principles that you uh, and other warriors in this fight, that it actually nutrition is a lot more simple than we're led to believe. Yes. So, so yeah, and the nutrition- You know, this actually, I'm sorry, Kelly. No, no, please, please. sounds like, a page ripped straight from the big tobacco playbook. Even right. if the study still shows that cigarettes might be bad, it still confuses the issue. It muddies the water. And uh, people who watch my channel regularly, they know that when the study is completed, if the researchers or if the funders don't like the results of the study, this study can, it, it's called fi file drawing. They just put it, put it in a file drawer and it never sees the light of day. They have no mandate to publish a study whatsoever. Right. And so if the study comes out just egregiously bad, like, oh my God, Coke causes cancer, then they'll just, they'll put it in the file drawer and it exactly. never, no, it's never published. Nobody knows about that. And, and, and in many of the contracts, the Coca-Cola or the big food company, they actually have the final say before they own that intellectual property. And they have the final say before it's published. That, that's right. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> and I, I, I just, you know, have an opinion and, and, and you know, I've gotten into the, the head of the Tufts uh, research, uh, the Tufts school called me and I, I, I've been promoting this new food compass study and I've been in a lot of conversations with academics, um, you know, have told me that they are just not influenced by the fact that they've taken millions of dollars, both in research donations and personal payments from food. And really just beating the table that we need to accept money from food because we need this nutrition research. I'll just say it. I don't think we need nutrition research. I think nutrition research has absolutely gaslighted the problem. Um, I, I think you make a great point about tobacco. I think the only difference of what's happening to kids right now, getting them addicted to a highly addictive drug of sugar, the only thing different between that and what happened with tobacco is that what's happening now with sugar and food happening to our children is an order of magnitude worse. I, I really do believe that. And I don't want to just say, you know, the firms I was working for and what I was doing in D.C. were the exact firms that were built on the backs of tobacco, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And I think it's very interesting because this has all come out. We don't have the documents that I saw from the from the food, uh, big sugar right now. But we actually do have um, there's a database of 
of PR documents from the tobacco industry that came out in a lawsuit. And it says this explicitly, and this is exactly what Big Food is doing. It said one line from the from the 80s is that um, research is like mothers. Everyone respects them. Everyone listens to them. And all we need to do is just fund research for the sake of research. That's exactly what's happening. Um, and I think another link, another step on the playbook that, that I, I, I just, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think most people know about this. And it just, it's actually just almost hard to believe when you think about it. But Coke also during this time took that research and used it to directly pay millions of dollars to organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Diabetes Association. And you literally had during this time, the American Diabetes Association, while Coke was you know, pushing for diabetes water to be government subsidized for kids. Not only did the American Diabetes Association not say uh, anything against that, they actually on their website encouraged small cans of Coke as a good move for diabetics. I remember that, I remember so, that um, as so, a doctor and I was like, what the hell did you just, you just recommended Coca-Cola, the full, full strength sugar Coca-Cola, but just in a tinier can. And I was like, right. What the hell is going on? And so for people who don't really understand how this works, when a when a like a, a big academy like the American Academy of Pediatrics or the American Academy of Family Physicians, who don't no longer takes that kind of money, I don't know if the AAP still does, when they receive a humongous check, they're not going to come out and start saying, no, Coca-Cola is good for you. What it's going to do is it's going to have a very subtle hush effect. Right. 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 And so if it weren't for that two million dollar grant or fund or whatever, then they would, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics would literally be tweeting parents attention. Please do not give your children any soft drinks. They will give them cavities. They will give them obesity. They will give them type two diabetes. Alert, alert, warning, warning, warning. But with that two million dollar grant, they're like, well, you need to minimize this sort of thing, you know, it, it needs to be on the minimized list, which it's, that's a sellout 100%, in my opinion. hundred percent, hundred percent. And I think this is important. Everyone, right. And this isn't personal. This isn't personal, but we have to acknowledge the economic concerns. I think this gets to the next thing. My other clients and the other, you know, the biggest spender in DC, which is pharma. So right after a meeting with the soda companies, you go to pharma, which is the biggest spender in DC, the biggest spender on research in this country. Um, you know, the, the biggest spender on public affairs work on almost everything. And you would think, right, just, just stepping back or, you know, most people would just assume that health organizations like like take the American Diabetes Association would be starting with the premise of how do we keep people from getting diabetes. But that is not how healthcare works. It is how do we treat people once they get diabetes. So the key thing to understand is that the every entity of health, uh, from pharma companies to hospitals to med schools to the NIH and the American Diabetes Association, the medical groups, they're not taking responsibility for the fact that everyone's getting sick. They're not taking responsibility right. that right. diabetes is up 700% in, in a generation. Exactly. That and it is their responsibility. Right. It, it is, is their responsibility. Nobody, you would expect these, that. These huge grants to their foundations and to their funds. It, 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 they, then they're content to kind of sit back and be like, well, we don't really know what causes childhood. Obesity. People are lazy. We don't really know what causes it. We think maybe it's genetic. We're right. not sure. We're doing a lot of research on it though. And it's like, what the hell? Dude, Coca Cola and Reese's Puffs, which was recently graded by the Tufts Food Compass to be right. better than a, a egg for breakfast. Right. You should That's feed right. your children Add Reese's Puffs. I shit mm -hmm. you not. Oh, no. Yeah. It was in their guidelines that it's way better than a, than an egg fried in butter. And and so I, I can't imagine I'm out of that now because I still have a small practice, but I'm on YouTube and I'm, I'm telling it like it is. But the average doctor who's still afraid of the medical board, still afraid of their their professional society, they've got to be miserable because, you know, doctors are not stupid. No, they can. They got through medical school. They know what's causing diabetes in children and obesity in children, but they really kind of feel like they need to not say too much, or they'll get in trouble. If you go against the American Academy um, of Pediatrics uh, as a as a pediatrician or or the American Diabetes Association, you're at risk of. T tell me if I'm wrong, your doctor. I, I, you know, of having your license in question. I mean, they, these these organizations really set the guidelines and the standard of care. 
Um, and I think there's a lot of fear. I think you make a really great point. I mean, you know, as a quick aside, I've been really inspired by my sister, Dr. Casey Means, who founded this company Levels, which helps with metabolic health now. But she was the pride of the family, Stanford Med School, top of her class, president of her Stanford undergrad class, and a surgeon. And she looked around uh, and realized that she had no idea why the patients were sick below her knife. And she realized, traced the money and realized that she didn't learn one nutrition class at Stanford, at Stanford Med School. They didn't require one, like 80% of med schools. And all of her classes were in pharmacology and all doctors learn is how to treat people and all they're responsible for is that. And what the link she put together, looking around her, doctors have the highest rate of burnout and the highest rate of suicide of any profession. So I, I agree with you. I think doctors are very smart. They're very dedicated. We have actually this crazy system where we basically are a magnet, literally, for the most dedicated, smartest people in the world come to the America to be a doctor and learn. And then they find themselves in this system where patients are systematically getting more and more sick. You know, and Casey realized, and she had the bravery to drop out after 12 years of training, uh, she realized that the a person she was doing surgery on, when she didn't even realize that she they were sick doing a sinusitis, she was head and neck surgeon, that they were under her knife seven months before that. And, and these patients kept coming back. The root cause of why we're sick isn't being treated by this plethora of drugs and surgeries and procedures that we're doing. It's just a Band-Aid. Um, and I think the key thing to understand, right? I think you said it really well, this subtlety, the, 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 the money, the, the, the money, from food companies to literally medical organizations. And of course, the main funding to, to, mm. to med schools, to medical organizations, you know, is pharma. And it's it's all about interventions. All of these institutions make money on interventions when people are sick. Right. Absolutely. If you Absolutely. take it's any if you take any, it's just then this is not conspiracy. This is just a statement of fact. I don't think anyone would even disagree with this. But if you take a diabetes, you know, we spend over a trillion dollars on diabetes care in the country right now right? If people are eating whole foods, right, th there's less patients. But then once you have diabetes, it's a, even though it's reversible, they say it's a lifetime condition that needs treatment. That's, that's a beautiful situation where then Medicare, Medicaid, you know, multiples more than our defense budget is going literally to the results of diabetes, right? It's a total reversible and preventable condition. But none of these groups are talking about why people are actually getting diabetes. And then, of course, all the money, 95% of healthcare spending isn't going to trying to get you know, obese, potentially diabetic kids, better food, it's, it's waiting for them to get sick and then treating them. So that's what the money does. It, it basically normalizes this incentive. And then of course, as Casey talks about it, med schools and doctors, you know, and pharma, it's, it's this warrior mindset. It's that we're standing, you know, once people are getting sick with great treatments, but, but they've, they've diluted this systemically. We've taken good people and, 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 and basically made it that nobody's asking why there's so much devastation. And just, you know, one other thing that, that, that I think is really endemic to the system, you know, on, on the Barry Weiss podcast recently, I was debating a leading obesity doctor from, from Harvard um, about this new uh, uh, obesity drug, which, which is, I think, uh, a really a good microcosm of these dynamics. And the question I had was just very simple. Um, it's that we're pushing for government funding for this drug, which is going to be about $12,000 per patient per year, and it's a lifetime drug. And my point was very simple, which is that it would be multiple cheaper to literally just buy every obese American healthy food. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. And, much cheaper. Now, and, let's, and, speaking and, yeah, of food, yeah. let's go back, Callie. Yeah. Let's go back to the SNAP benefits, which stands yeah, for Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. It used to be called Food Stamps. They changed the name because that had a little bit of a derogatory uh, feel to right. it. Right. So on SNAP, the reason that people are given SNAP benefits is because they're they're in poverty. They're they they're not making enough income to afford nutrition, right? We we established that earlier. That's what the program is for. It actually has nutrition in the name. Yeah. Now, all of my all of my followers are very common sense people, and but I want to ask everybody a question. So listen up. The SNAP benefits, people pay taxes. That, those taxes, part of that goes to paying for SNAP benefits for people who cannot afford real food to help them afford food to feed their families, to feed their mm -hmm. children. Should federal dollars be allowed to be spent on Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew? Everybody tell me in the comments, yes or no. Now I'm like Callie, I'm a bit of a libertarian. Mm -hmm. And I think if you want to, if you want to drink 10 liters of, of Coke a day, go for it, brother. That's yep. fine. It's your life. But yep. if you're going to tax me 
And I pay taxes, brother. Believe me. <laughs> you're going to tax me. And then you're going to use that money to literally pay for somebody's young child. So, and so, first of all, it's a young parent. They're 100%. busy. They're trying to get ahead in life. They don't have a degree in nutrition. They don't know. And plus, Tough School of Nutrition just came out and said, no, Reese's Puffs are fine. Your kids can have them every damn morning. Right. And so they use their SNAP benefits to buy Reese's Puffs, which is literal pure chocolate sugar. And That's they spoiled. give that to their children every morning right. because Tufts Nutrition said it was okay. And the federal government gives them the money to buy it with. Should Coca-Cola and Pepsi, should you be able to, to use your SNAP benefits to buy those? Yes or no. Now, Granny Barry would say, she's back from the olden days, Callie. She mm -hmm. would say beggars can't be choosers. Mm. But in a lot of people that they feel like that's offensive and they feel like that that's uh, paternalistic, patriarchal. I want to know what people think in the comments. Do you think that is that is that a or is that a common sense? Like if, if I if I was going to ask you, Callie, Callie, dude, me and Nisha are down on our luck. Can I borrow a couple of thousand bucks from you just for a while? I just need it. And you're like, well, yeah, man, what do you need it for? Right. I'd be like, well, I, I'm going to buy some weed and a little bit of blow. And you'd be like, no, no, you can't borrow $2,000. You're going to spend yeah. it on weed and blow. No. Now, if you're going to pay the rent and pay the electric bill, yeah. 100%, I would loan you the money. That's kind of how I look at this. If, 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 if I'm being given something because I can't afford, I don't really get to be the boss. And I don't think people on SNAP benefits feel that way. I think that Coca-Cola and Pepsi and all the people that spend the millions of dollars in lobbying, they want that to stay on SNAP because that's part of their bottom line. So let me get this straight. You're telling me that Coca-Cola mm -hmm. had you mm -hmm. compile a list of uh, NAACP and other ethnic organizations. And then they went to them and said, hey, uh, you know, the, these Republican congressmen and senators, they're trying to take away your people's, your people's free, free choice. And they're trying to take Coca-Cola off SNAP. We feel like, I mean, I don't know. Do you think that's racist? I don't know. Maybe it is. Well, and then all of a yeah, sudden, I remember right. this. News stories, every news right. cycle, in every newspaper, every television news program talking about how racist this was. Right, right. And you're well, telling me that Coke funded that. Yeah, it's bipartisan, right? So they go to the, the left. You know, they have, you know, the spokespeople, you know, Al, Al Sharpton was, was involved in this too, you know, go and hound the left about being racist, which nobody wants to hear. And then they really, it's, it's a very subtle, but they really pervert this nanny state thing on the right. So you go to the right and run these campaigns and say it's nanny state to snatch the Coke, you know, this great American beverage that people enjoy from the hands of lower income folks. But of course, it's not about snatching the Coke away. Again, we're not disagreeing with the ability of Coke to exist. But as a public policy matter, and, I, you know, I, beggars can't be, I think that was an interesting, but it's, it's more just basic. It's just like we have public policy. Our public policy, just as a matter of fact, the nutrition program should not be uh, paying for diabetes water. We are being like, I, I, I feel like I'm in a bizarre world sometimes. Yep. It, it, is, it, are we not being brought to our knees as a country with our human capital and with our budget? by metabolic conditions tied to food are yeah. eight of the 10 leading causes of death in America, largely preventable metabolic conditions, you know, tied to food from diabetes and heart disease. Now Alzheimer's being called type three diabetes, kidney disease, COVID deaths, you know, just, just going down the list. I, I, I mean, I mean, are our children, our precious human capital who 25% of now have prediabetes, 45% are either obese or overweight mass issues, autoimmune conditions, 15% of kids now have fatty liver disease, 25% of kids, which I think is highly related to metabolic conditions, 25 in, in 2021 said they're contemplating suicide of teenagers. I mean, we are seeing like unprecedented metabolically centered issues and, and, and we're paying for diabetes water, like, yeah. like, like, which is costing, by the way, trillions of dollars of downstream health effects. So like, you know, I'll take it to me. I enjoy a beer sometimes. Like I, I enjoy, you know, having a drink. I would never would think that the government should be, as a matter of public policy, subsidizing beer for me, right? It's the same thing with sugar. And I do think, you know, when you look at the basic just facts, you look at the dopamine release that sugar causes, you look at the long-term impacts of sugar. This is a drug. This is a highly addictive drug. Um, 
So as a matter of public policy, you know, it, it makes no sense to be subsidizing. And it's not, and by the way, it's not just um, it's not just the food stamps. Um, you know, another huge one is school lunches, which have no sugar limit and are federally and state subsidized. And then, of course, something I also worked on a little bit is just and this comes up every couple of years is maintaining the crop and, and uh, agriculture subsidies where 90 percent of those go to basically what makes up a Reese's puff. So a Reese's puff, basically any food, any processed food you pick up the label on, you point this out so well, it's the trifecta, right? right. It's highly processed grains, it's some crappy, I, I don't think they should be called seed or vegetables, I think it should be called industrial byproduct, which is what it is. Um, and, then, um, and then added sugar, obviously. All three ingredients, evolutionarily unprecedented, basically invented in the last 120 years. Um, that's what we subsidize with 90% billions of dollars. Vegetables and fruit is 0.4% of federal subsidies and considered a specialty crop. So yep. yeah, I mean th this is this is just not smart. And and you know I think you make a great point on a mom and a parent. Like like I am privileged and I am optimistic and I am happy to be in this fight. You know, following along you and many other people have inspired me. But most people in this country have to defer to institutions, right? Whether you're on the left or the right. We need to, as institutions, like like from a foundation, we expect those institutions are looking out for the ability of our cells to work. And and I, I think it, but this makes sense for a particular lower income mom uh, to defer to those institutions. And I don't, I think people Why would be shocked. Yeah, yeah, I think people would be shocked that we're actually just pummeling, not just with the food stamp subsidization, but the fact that a Coke is cheaper than water because there's so many subsidized ingredients in there. You know, and it's, it's, it's all people can, can afford. I think parents would also be shocked to learn that in the face of this catastrophe, particularly with children of metabolic conditions, the FDA says that it's okay for 10% of a two-year-old's diet to be added sugar, 10%. Yep. Now, it's yep. just like alcohol. It's just like alcohol. Alcohol is legal. Um, people enjoy it. You know, it has societal consequences, but we're not banning it. That went bad in the 20s. Uh, but but there's not like an FDA recommendation for it, <laughs> like right, like right. like the like the nutritional the nutritional guidelines are basically it's zero. It's like it's like and the nutritional guidelines set everything. So the fact that we actually and 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 in tracing that and, and this is also something I said you know but but the way it, it traces what we talked about with the academic research how Coke and Pharma and all these interests are able to funnel and actually be predominant. Funders, private industry is, I think, seventy to eighty percent of all academic research spending. Yep. They fund both in direct research payments, which is the currency for a researcher, and this is important, direct consulting. So, so many nutritional research, including the the person who's the head of that tough study that said uh, Reese's puffs were better than beef, right? They have also received direct payments, just direct payments from food companies, right? 60 so, different companies, 60 yeah, yeah. different big food right, companies right. have funded Tufts University School of yeah. Nutrition, who now tells us that uh, Reese's Puffs and Lucky Charms are green light. That means to be encouraged and that beef and eggs are red lighted, which means to be discouraged. That's right. That's right. And, 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 that's, just, and I just did a video about this last week. I've got all the documentation in the show notes. If anybody just heard me say that and went, that can't be right. Yeah, it's right. It's absolutely the truth. And so, so basically the federal government is funding the SNAP benefits, which is mm -hmm. letting, allowing people to buy sugar water and industrial waste and all the all of the, the grains, the, the highly processed wheat, rice, oats, and corn. And right. also they're funding the school lunch and the school breakfast programs which have no upper limit for sugar, but they do have an upper limit. It can only have so much saturated fat, but there's no upper limit for sugar. Yeah. And they're also funding on the other end of this, Medicare and Medicaid, so that when these people do develop diabetes, fatty liver, obesity, hypertension, all the other things that go along with this, whether children or adults, then that they cover that as well. So it's like they're, they're basically paying the salaries for the big food companies on the front end, and they're paying the salaries for big pharma on the back end. Which are the two biggest, which are the two biggest employers in the United States. Um, also the huge biggest political lobbyists. Power and biggest lobbyists. And I call it the devil's bargain because you kind of understand 
that food companies are trying to use, you know, resources at their disposal to make food cheaper and more addictive. You know, it's not great, but you kind of get that. You would expect the healthcare system then to be ringing the alarm bell, but it's just as a factual statement. It's a statement of fact. The healthcare system makes money when people are sick. True. So they turn a blind eye when the food companies lobby and they turn a blind eye to the nutrition. So, so, you know, going back to the research funding, I think this is very important for folks to understand when the FDA makes their nutritional guidelines every five years, that's not a nonpartisan, you know, FDA bureaucrat making those recommendations. They put together a panel of outside experts and it's people just like the folks that did this tough study that says Reese's puffs are better than eggs. It's, it's all outside researchers. And in 2020, 95, and you could Google this, it's, it's all over, 95% of the people that made the nutritional guidelines that said 10% of sugar, uh, diet being sugar for a two-year-old is okay, were directly paid off, direct payments from pharma and or food companies, um, yep. you know, processed food companies. And that's how you know, back my earlier career, that's how you're able to get it, that you're able to, you're able to fund them. It's the same thing with pharma. Uh, the, 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 the department and the, the FDA panel that's making uh, obesity recommendations right now, those aren't FDA bureaucrats. Those are outside people. Back when I was working for pharma, 2011, 2012, it was all about opioids. And they had a blue ribbon panel on opioids uh, for, for guidelines. And the head of that panel was the Dean of Stanford Med School, who was a pain specialist. And the exact year that he uh, issued this panel with a ton of conflicts and said, uh, we should have loose uh, opioid guidelines, essentially, which led to devastation. Uh, Pfizer, one of the largest opioid makers, made a direct payment for pain research, $3 million uh, to, to that professor and, and, and then school he oversaw. So, you know, this is how it works. Uh, it's not that complicated. And, and the fact that there's such a close collaboration between private industry, you know, academia and the regulatory agencies and such a revolving door, you know, where you obviously have the FDA director, you know, coming from academia, going to the FDA, then going to the board of Pfizer. It, it's all this just revolving world of influence um, where, uh, where there's just massive conflicts and we're being asked to believe that that doesn't matter. So tell me this, Callie, when you yeah. were in that situation with Coca-Cola consulting with them, how, how did this feel to you at that time? Because at that time, you were a young man. You were trying to make right. a name for yourself. You were trying to right. get in the industry. We're all trying to get by and get ahead. That's that's human nature. Yeah. Did this feel off? Did it feel wrong to you? And also, did you hear anybody, any other grumblings from other consultants or even Coca-Cola employees like, man, this is kind of shady? I have to be honest with you. It did not. It, this is This is a lot of this is in retrospect. Um, because what happens is, you know, I, and I've, you know, my whole life I've been chasing the institutions, you know, Stanford, I went to Harvard business school and I do think I really feel that these institutions and especially in DC really breed conformity. So, you know, it's about the magnificence of the American agriculture and pharmaceutical industries. I was buying that, right? I was buying that we were getting lower income folks, cheap calories, you know, working for pharma, there's a lot of mission-based talk about you know, curing these diseases and, you know, really life-saving cures. The, the, it is the biggest lie in the country, right, that the medical system, you know, has innovated in a life-saving cure. The more we spend on healthcare, the worse life expectancy goes down and chronic diseases are exploding. The more stands we prescribe, the more rates of heart disease go up. The more SSRIs we prescribe, the more suicide and depression go up. The more metformin we prescribe, the more diet. It's because diabetes. We're, 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 it's because we're treating things in silos, right? And there's this lie where everyone's just hammering away at their siloed issue, but then have, Rome is burning, right? So yeah, it, it's 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 taken a long time for me. And again, like, uh, uh, you know, inspired by my sister, inspired, you know, who led me through her journey, dropping out of med school, being radicalized on this, reading books by you, um, you know, breaking out of the system. But 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 I feel it's my life's calling now to both talk about this and also we've got to change the incentives. Americans respond to incentives. Right now, as you very well stated, the incentive for an American is to eat crappy food, which is subsidized, and then healthcare only kicks in once they get sick and they get free healthcare essentially once they get sick. That's the incentives. People follow incentives, but people aren't systematically trying to have their children be obese and pre-diabetic and themselves be sicker than their parents were, so they're gonna miss their 
their kids' uh, milestones and grandkids' milestones. But that's happening, and I think it's because of incentives. Um, so no, it did not feel, to be honest. And you know, and I like it to go. Yeah. Very important, yeah. Callie. Yeah, I want everybody to listen to this carefully. From where Callie was in his career, the people surrounding him. Even though when we're talking about this now in 2023, it sounds egregious. It sounds almost satanic. But in that situation, in that moment, it felt like he was just doing business. Yeah. Yeah. I think people are waking up. You know, I, I, we talked earlier about the doctors. It's the number one burnout, number one suicide, you know, rate. I, I think I think there's a bit, you know, I've talked to a lot. A lot of doctors have reached out, right? A couple are defiant and defensive that the medical system I mean, I don't know what, what their argument could be. It's not, it's not producing healthier patients, but you know, a little bit defensive, but I, I, there's, there's been pretty much a, a thought. It's, it's, it's kind of like even chatting with, you know, people at, at high up in the organization I've been attacking who I still know and, and friendly with, it's just like, yeah, it kind of is right. Right. But everyone's, I mean, these are the two largest industries in the country. I kind of liken it, you know, to, to not to, not to call this out too much, but you know, uh, business school at Harvard Business School, you know, and it, it is this institution very similar to D.C. It takes very ambitious people. You know, there's a lot of examples. I have a friend who wrote their essay for admittance about reforming healthcare care and, and how we need to fix inequities. And because of this chamber, the, these, the, these, these institutions, they drive you to conformity. You know, she goes to McKinsey, uh, a, a leading consulting firm, and was working on the healthcare group that helped Purdue Pharma prescribed more opioids and it's now getting like massively investigated and had to pay a huge fine. It's like the people are being funneled into pharma companies. You know, people are being funneled into a big ton of people working at Pepsi now. These are all good people. They're friends. I'm not trying to call them out too much, but it's just like, I do think systemically high level, our elite institutions basically demand conformity and there's huge economic incentives. I think we all implicitly know right, that big institutions are really letting us down. I think we know big food is obviously, right? Just look at the Mm -hmm. obesity rates between, you know, a Japanese person in the United States and a Japanese person in Japan. It's 4X worse obesity, right? This isn't genetic as we're being told. Um, And, um, you know, and I I, I just think we all see these institutions letting us down. Um, But but can I, you know, in a weird way, again, we're taking it back to what you said at the beginning. I don't think the message is everything is screwed here. Um, I, agree. I think I, agree. I think I think the medical system has made a lot. You know, has we've lost our way, but we've done. I don't think a person 100 years ago would imagine where we are now in a lot of respects. No. And no. I don't know the fact that a lot of folks are watching no. this YouTube, waking up, listening to podcasts, reading books. Um, I think we will change it, change it slowly. But um, I think there's just no other way to get it back to food and kind of kind of take down this sick care system that we have um, where we're being poisoned by our food um, and then have these incremental cures that are profiting the system, but bankrupting our country. It's just not mathematically going to work. But yeah, it's still chronic chronic metabolic disease is going to break the the country. It's going to break the federal government. Mathematically. We don't do something about it. And I'm so happy to hear about your sister who stepped away and said, enough, I can't do this anymore. And more and more doctors, every day or either taking that step or they're saying, you know what, I'm going to start telling my patients to eat real food. And if the state medical board wants to come get me, I guess they can come get me. And so more and more doctors, and and that's a very unusual position for a doctor to take. You know that Mm -hmm. doctors are very risk averse. They do not like confrontation. They do not like risk. They do not want to get a phone call from the medical board. Right. But when you see, When you see what you and I have seen, when you hear this, when you read one of these books, you're like, holy crap, Mm -hmm. I'm part of the problem. I'm not. That's why, because so many doctors are burnt out, suicide rates sky high, because all they do is write more and more prescriptions for people who get sicker and sicker and sicker. That's not fun. That's not, that's not why any doctor went to medical school. When you ask Jimmy, why do you want to, you want to be a doctor? He's like, yes. Why Jimmy? So you can write lots of prescriptions. No, right. so I can help people, save people, make people healthy. That's why I want to go to medical school. And then every doctor gets in their position, gets in their clinic, gets in the, the ER or wherever, gets in the OR. They're not helping people get better. Unless you're a trauma surgeon, you're not saving anybody's life. You're really kind of making people sicker and just minding the status quo until you've got your 20 years in, you can retire. And that's depressing. That's right. And I see doctors every day reaching out to me saying, hey, 
how do you how are you able to do what you do and not get in trouble with the medical board? And I tell them I have gotten in trouble with the medical board more than once. Yeah. But you yeah. know what? If they want to come at me again and try to take my license, come at me because I will never shut up because this is life and death. That's right. For people who are not doctors and who are not dietitians, they don't have the academic training to be able to look at this this study and go, "That's utter bullshit," and look at this study and go, "No, this is a very good good study. This is well done." They don't know how to do that. All they can do is trust the authority figures in their life, who might be their doctor, it might be their mama, or it might be the Tufts School of Nutrition and and health policy. And so they, they saw, oh, it's a new food compass. Okay, I'm going to go by that because I really want my young children to be healthy. And then five years later, their children are obese and have to, and have pediatric type 2 diabetes. So now that's enough depressing stuff. Mm. We got, I guarantee you we got doctors and nurses watching this live. Or they're going to yeah. be watching on the replay. Right. Let's start talking about what are we going to do, Callie? What can Great. we do? Yeah. I'm just a truck driver. I'm just a nurse. I'm just, I work at Walmart. I'm just whatever. I'm middle management. What right. can I do to make a difference? Let's talk about that because everybody watching, all 2,700 you guys, you guys can absolutely change this. You can fix this. It ain't going to happen overnight, but we can start tomorrow morning breaking this system down and building up a new system that actually makes sense. What are we going to do, Callie? Great. Well, let me let me just list off a couple. So if you're if you're in the system right now, and I would just say this, I have been inspired, like I'm doing this path and from a unique background from folks like you, from folks like my sister, Dr. Casey Means, from Mark Hyman, from others who have basically uh, bucked the system, you know, who, who basically um, saw inside and said, there's something really, really wrong here and created content. And I would just say this, there is an optimistic generational, I think economic trend that's gonna happen in the next uh, 20 years where mathematically we are going to go bankrupt from this sick care system. Like it's 20% of GDP, it's growing at an increasing rate, it's gonna be 40%. I don't think people understand how fast we'll have to shift to root cause frameworks of food as medicine and getting back to basics and encouraging exercise. We literally are just gonna cease to exist from a budgetary standpoint as a country. And I do think, I would just say this, you know, Casey, my sister, when she dropped out of residency after hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and you know all this training you know it was tough right it was a tough decision it was the greatest decision she's ever made and i do think if you are feeling stuck in the system i just say like uh, there's so much opportunity in content and in potential solutions with your knowledge um and i do think you know you can make change from within the system but but i, I do think more and more people uh, coming out and speaking out and creating alternate solutions is really important. Okay, so what are some tactical things we do? I think number one, at the most basic level, before societal and policy change happens, right? You really feel confident, really feel confident to ask questions. Humans are the only animal uh, in the world and animals that we feed that have chronic obesity and diabetes and metabolic dysfunction. We have an innate understanding of what we should be eating and what we should be doing and the fact that we should be seeing the sunlight and moving that's how kids are born They're, they have a predisposition to these things of natural food so i just do think very simply like going down this journey reading more of the books by the folks we mentioned and asking questions of your pediatrician or your doctor particularly when it comes to chronic conditions this is my framework if you have a appendicitis or a complicated childbirth or you know a gunshot wound or something like acute like a, like an urgent infection yes 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 talk to your doctor but we the medical system deserves no benefit of the doubt when it comes to chronic conditions which are 80 percent of the causes of death of americans and take up 90 percent of healthcare costs do not implicitly trust your doctor on preventing chronic conditions, if they're pushing a statin on you, if they're pushing these drugs on you, if they're pushing, you know, uh, uh, certain drugs like Adderall on your tab, step back. Have, it's scary to go up against your doctor. It's scary, but I think it's very important. On the public policy level, um, I'll get to my company in a sec, but it's truemet.com. But on our email list, we're also doing some grassroots effort. And this is my framework on public policy. There is a lot of money we're going up against with pharma and food, and we've talked about that. But I've talked to a lot of legislators in the last couple months, and I've worked in politics before, as I've talked about. There's one thing that can counteract money, and that is grassroots support. And what I think is going to happen, and I'm going to work on if you sign up on truemet.com, 
we're going to catalyze grassroots support. I'm actually going with a coalition of other food as medicine folks, and we're going to meet with a number mm. of senators and members of Congress on both the left and right. And the way we can counteract is, is, is grassroots support. And, and something I really want to rally for, and, and there's going to be more information on this, follow me on Twitter, sign up on that email list I mentioned. Um, I think it's about the new nutrition guidelines. I think they should be zero. If we can get sugar nutrition guidelines, it's a very simple issue. But if we can get that to zero, where it obviously should be, that then impacts a lot of these things that we talked about. Uh, you know, parents defer to those guidelines. And when they're at 10% for sugar for a two-year-old, that gets into a lot of foods. It's a, if it's 0%, that starts impacting childhood nutrition. It starts impacting school lunches. So we're really going to work on a grassroots effort to really get that nutrition guy. So we gotta, right. we gotta pick our battles. Uh, the last thing I'd say, doctor, I got one other just specific uh, policy. I don't know if we're going over, but I got one other no, we're good. Uh, we're good. folks can do right now. Is, is, um, this, is, this is the question I've been asking. It's how can we incentivize patients right now to not wait to get sick, but keep themselves healthy? If we change incentives, I think it changes everything. So something I'm very interested in is these HSA, FSA accounts. I actually think it's a great part of healthcare policy. Most of you probably, uh, listeners probably have heard of them. They're somewhat lower optimized. But they're these accounts where you can basically choose where to spend on your health. And I think fundamentally what we have to spend on is less on interventions once we're, once we're sick and more ways to keep us healthy. What my company, TrueMed.com, is doing, what we found is that if you have a doctor's note saying you should eat healthy food or exercise, to prevent a certain condition and prevent a certain condition. And most of us should be on a prevention plan for metabolic conditions. You can actually buy healthy food and exercise tax-free and you can max those accounts out 7,200 bucks for a family. So I think, and I, this is part of the mission I'm on is to put an exercise equipment or broccoli, you know, and a dietary intervention versus statin for preventing heart disease, right? <clears throat> food and exercise interventions, just, I think we would all agree are much better and actually do count for medical spending. Um, so that's one way right now with your tax dollars, and those HSA FSA accounts are usually used for once you get sick to save up for drugs once you already get heart disease or something like that. You can actually, use, we like to think of it as kind of a revolutionary act to actually use those right now to stay healthy and prevent disease with root cause habits, not just prevent one disease, but you know, prevent a, a, a lot of diseases by eating and exercising. And we're working to incentivize that. But that's where we need to move uh, public policy um, is we need to be using more of our tax uh, advantage dollars and healthcare dollars to yep. stay healthy. Yeah, and, and then specific public policies, we got to get rid of crop subsidies, the, the ag subsidies. Yep. Um, and we've got to treat sugar like more and more like tobacco. I do think that's a free market solution. As Absolutely. I hope I've been explaining, they have been knowingly and consciously rigging the system. Um, they have been uh, obfuscating research everything the cigarette companies have been doing and the externalities. These shouldn't be subsidized products. We should be pricing in the externalities like we do with cigarettes. So there's some efforts working on that. We're talking to a couple billionaires and, and some great lawyers about bringing class action and various legal yes. challenges to these companies. Yep. I think that's really going to be what breaks this open, just like it did mm -hmm. with uh, Purdue. There's going to be some young and hungry assistant district attorney somewhere. Right. That's right. That's right who is going to say, you know, I think these guys know they're doing harm. And I'll bet you if I could get my hands on all the emails and all the documents. And so all of a sudden, if there if there is an indictment and a, some, some subpoenas go out, we want all your emails, Coca-Cola. We want all your documents. We want all your manuals. We want every single penny you've spent on every single thing. I think all of a sudden we would it would be uh, better than the Twitter drops that we've been seeing. Like there would be stuff coming out where these guys know that they're causing harm. They know they're causing poor innocent children to be obese and type two diabetic, and for poor little babies to have fatty liver almost before they can walk. That's what we oh, find out. Oh, I'm, I'm I, I am waiting for that young, hungry assistant district attorney to say, come on, boss, let me let me run with this. Let me run with this. Because when that starts, it's all going to fall down. Ken, you, you, you're very smart. You're actually getting very detailed there, which is actually something we're really excited about. So just again, high level, I'm devoting my life to this. Putting company. that out there in the uh, universe. Yeah, uh, Kelly, but, Kelly, but, but we, well, we're working on it. So so what's been a, so amazing is I'm sure on this journey is you know meeting folks like you, but also just very interesting inbounds and a huge opportunity as well is district attorneys, but also the attorney generals 
in states. Yeah. Yeah. And what's very interesting is every state, I think literally every state is it's on the verge of bankruptcy due to their health obligations. So they have a real rationale actually to look into this, into how things are being rigged. And an attorney general actually much easier than class action can launch investigations and, and, and compel discovery and compel the emails. So, so we're actually been so fortunate to just be brought into this issue and in this fight and, and, and playing a small role, but we're actually, um, you know, you, you should chat with some of these attorney generals. We're trying to just get them chatting with the smartest people. Yeah. Um, and th yeah, there's a really huge right. appetite. There's a huge appetite, um, both on the left and the right to, um, to start asking questions, looking at some emails, uh, cause we do have a rig system and, and we should Absolutely. simply embrace that. Absolutely. And, um, and I think, gosh, if I think if we change incentives, you know, it's like drinking. It's like, I think Americans, you know, they make some mistakes, but generally when there's the right guidelines, like people try to do the right thing for themselves and their family. We just are addicting kids to this substance at two years old at one year old. And, um, and if we start investigating that, but yeah, there, there's a couple angles, but uh, I, I just appreciate you and your community here just looking at the comments and it's just, I, I, it's been a life changing journey for me to start asking questions. I'm still obviously on that Absolutely. journey with the one year old son. Um, and I just, uh, it's great to be part of this movement. Absolutely. Now let's sum up, Callie. Yeah. I've got, I've got six things written down. Some that <laughs> you spoke about, some that I thought of while you were speaking. Now, nice. Everybody listen up. This is stuff Good. you can start doing right now. As soon as you click off this video, number one, start paying attention again. So many people have just clocked out. They're just like, it's, this is psycho world. This is an episode of the twilight zone. You need to know who your congressman is. You need to know who your senator is. You need to know who your district attorney is. You need to know these things. You need to be active in this stuff. Again, I know that sounds, I don't know, almost paternal to even say that. It sounds weird. But everybody, you need to stop watching Survivor 27 or Dancing with the Stars 38 or whatever it's up to now. That's not helping these children, okay? Start paying attention. Start getting back in the system and getting back in the game. Number two, you need to start boycotting these products and forbidding anybody in your family to use your checkbook to spend one damn red cent on any product that Pepsi or Coca-Cola, Kraft Heinz, Mondelez, any of these gigantic multi-billion dollar multinational corporations that literally sell poison to children. You need to boycott them. That's number that's number two. Number three, you need to start leading by example. You need to be eating a proper human diet and fixing yourself. When people see you and they haven't seen you in a few months, they need to go, damn, you look good. You've lost weight. I mean, you, you're glowing. Oh, my God. Lead by example. Number four, question authority. When you go to your doctor and they're like, oh, you're, you need this pill. Say, well, why, doc? Can you show me the research on that? But why, why does my four-year-old need Adderall? Are you sure? Isn't that an addictive substance? Isn't it just like methamphetamine, but legal? You ask questions. You can be respectful, but question all authority. Number five, ninja tactics. Alice is a mm. nurse. She, I saw her comment. She said, I'll get fired if I say this stuff. Mm. So I, there are so many nurse practitioners, mm. PAs, and nurses who mm. know they've got to they've got to check their boxes and say what they're told to say. But you know what you can do at home? You can use your little Hewlett Packard printer and your little computer, and you can make up a little trifold pamphlet. And you can say, okay, now that's all the stuff I was told that I have to tell you. Now, when you get home, here's a pamphlet that's got some YouTube channels and some book recommendations. I want you to look these guys up when you get home. That's called ninja tactics. Now, I don't want you to lose your job, Alice, but I do want you to honor the commitment you made to be a nurse and every doctor out there, you need to honor your damn oath and do no harm. And I don't care if you, if you might get fired by your HMO or you might get in trouble with the medical board, you took a damn oath brother and sister, and you need to uphold that oath. Number six, no subsidy on any sugar whatsoever. There needs to be no federal money spent on sugar, either to subsidize the growing of it or to subsidize it in, in school lunch, school breakfast, in hospitals, in prisons, or for the SNAP benefit program. Now, how are you gonna how are you gonna fight that? You got to go back to number one and start paying attention. Who is your congressman? Who is your senator? They need to know that you strongly oppose any further subsidization for sugar, and you oppose any further SNAP benefits paying for Reese's Puffs or Coca Cola or Pepsi Cola. 
what a, what a fantastic list. And I think number one in what you closed with, reaching out and knowing who your congressman is. I think a lot of times I've heard that people hear that and it's it's a little bit, sounds a little yeah. daunting. I know, um, I know. I, I've been digging deep into this. And I do think this is important. It, it's all about where the passion is. And if there is hundreds of thousands of parents and folks who are concerned about these issues, to me, it goes to my one-year-old son. <laughs> it's like he is walking into a buzzsaw right now yep. um, with metabolic dysfunction. I do think there's a lot of uh, rage, <laughs> frankly, and, and people that want to see change. We've got to channel it to the right outcome. It can't just be, uh, you can't do this and this would be great, but like we've got to do it to food stamps. We've got to do it to nutrition standards. Um, what I'm, wor I'm, you know, just went on Mark Hyman's podcast, working with a number of people. We're trying to channel some specific ask because if everyone, if a hundred thousand people can call, and make one ask, can start chipping away, that that's what the special interests are doing. It's very targeted. So again, I, you know, I've got my company, but what the real life passion is. You follow me on Twitter, Cali Means, or, or sign up at TrueMed.com. We're going to try to galvanize this grassroots and, and try to have specific asks, specific. Because if everyone can be in one voice, you know, as food stamp uh, re reappraisal comes up, as the nutrition guidelines start coming up for renewal, uh, we d we have another rigged board of, of folks who are totally paid off. One doctor from Harvard who says that obesity uh, isn't caused by what you eat, it's genetics, is literally on the nutrition board. But if we can really, if we can really speak in one voice uh, and channel your viewers and and it's a simple call, but that matters. That counteracts money. I think that's a great point, doctor. I love it. Callie Means, yeah. thank you so much. Now, you and your sister thank are you. working on a book. Tell us just right. a little bit about that, and I'll let you go. <laughs> that's great. Well, my sister, Dr. Casey Means, again, I, I mentioned, uh, dropped out of residency and started Levels Health, which is a metabolic health company, which helps you measure your glucose and understand what you're eating. And then I, I'm starting a, a, another company to incentivize healthy food, as I talked about, the HSAFSA, truemed.com. Uh, we're trying to fight this forward. And um, and we have a book from Penguin called Good Energy. And it's basically making the following point, uh, that I think the next paradigm of health is out of the siloed view where there's 42 different medical specialties and a pill for every condition. I think the revolution in health is this metabolic revolution, is understanding that everything almost is tied to metabolic health. Um, and that's going to be the thesis of the book through Casey's story inside and outside of the medical system. And then we're going to try to compile the best tactical tips, um, you know, th things that you've been talking about, but, but really try to really put our, a spin on the best tips to live an empowered uh, life before the system change. So that's going to be in about a year. Um, yeah, and check out truemed.com. We're really, again, uh, this is free for for, for, for customers. Um, it, it's a payment integration that actually makes food and exercise compliant, uh, which I'm excited about, you know, just again, there's many people just chipping away at a lot of different levels, but if we can save and buy food and exercise as medical purchases tax-free, uh, that's one area I'm really excited about. So those are the two things I'm trying to channel my efforts on. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Kelly. Guys, if you haven't that's already funny. done show, you got to share this video. This is the kind of video that's going to wake people up and begin to change the world for the better. So thank you, Callie Means. Man, it's been a pleasure. Hopefully you can come back and we can talk more about this. Obviously, I could talk for hours about this. This really pisses me off. Thank you, Callie. Thank you, doctor. Thank, thank you, you doctor. guys. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.